Welcome to another one of our continuing education webinars. Hello everyone, I'll be your host for today. My name is Luis M. Ruiz and I'll be presenting along with my colleague Fahad Safar. First, a few housekeeping chores. This course is an approved CEU presentation and VectorWorks Incorporated is an approved provider. Upon completion of the webinar, you will earn one AIA learning unit, which will be sent by email. And here are the learning objectives for the course. Understand how point cloud information is becoming prevailing and commonly used in the architectural industry. Discuss the differences between various point cloud file formats. Explain the process of using point cloud information for an architectural project and understand how to clean and filter data for optimization in a BIM software. Throughout the years, architects have been commissioned with interesting projects, and many of them involve documenting existing conditions of larger buildings with a great amount of complexity and detail that in many cases, by using traditional measuring technology, time and staff resources are quickly consumed hurting efficiency, and project budgets. Today, we'll talk about incorporating a technology that will enable us to shorten our delivery time. I refer to obtaining measurements of existing conditions with a greater level of accuracy and efficiency and what steps we can take to create a BIM model from which we can extract the necessary documentation. In order to make the best use of our time, I have broken down our collected information into a series of topics. This will keep you engaged and will help you digest knowledge in an easier way. First, we'll try to understand better what point cloud technology is. Then we'll learn about these interesting devices and what the process is in order to produce a point cloud file. Not that you'll ever have to create one yourself, but it is always good to know about the benefits of hiring the services of this technology. We'll also cover our very own experience of going through the process of creating a portion of the Philadelphia Museum of Art into a beam model based on point cloud technology. So what is point cloud technology? Point cloud technology has been around since the late 60s. A point cloud is typically explained as being a set of points in some coordinate system. Point clouds are usually created by 3D scanners, and these devices measure a large amount of points over the surface of an object and create a data file as the output. In many cases, point clouds can be rendered and inspected but not directly usable in most 3D applications. Therefore, these are mainly the snap bases for solid geometry, nerve surfaces, simple CAD drawings, and intelligent mean models. The architectural field has greatly benefited since surveyors incorporated this technology into the services they provide. Efficiency has been the recurring description by many of our colleagues. Existing constructions are now easier to document no matter the length, height or level of detail. Capital columns, cornices, roof dormers, window headers, wall reveals, pipes, silos, basically all surfaces that get hit by the laser get filed. Point cloud services are not only for scanning existing facades. Nowadays, these devices can get airborne when attached to drones, for example. These mobile scanners can take precise photos and measurements of valleys, mountains, monuments, rough landscapes, and thick forests. Let's move on to another point cloud sample, where the level of scanning detail is far more demanding. For getting those existing conditions where machinery, power stations, and mechanical systems fill the rooms very tightly. Surveyors can now provide accurate dimensions as well as the special relationships between objects. Now that we understand a little better the benefits of point cloud services, 
Let's move on, on to learning more about the scanning and delivery process. Here's a picture of a typical scanning station. These expensive toys can range from $50,000 to over $100,000. The one in the middle is a Trimble unit. It scans a 360-degree field of view in only three minutes. This device uses a Class 1 laser with a range of 120 meters. That's about 400 feet, and that range can be extended. Basically, laser beams are shot everywhere, and whenever the laser touches a surface, the locations or coordinates get recorded, you know, X, Y, and Z. The laser is then swapped out for a camera, and eventually RGB values get added to each dot once the photos get registered in place. Interior and exterior jobs need to be scanned from different locations in order to ensure precision. As we learn, each round may take between 3 to 10 minutes to capture the raw data. As with the use of traditional tripods, the surveyor needs to be sure each station matches the same height and it is perfectly leveled. You may see in your point cloud where the stations were placed as there are empty spots. Those spots are where the tripod was placed. After the site work is done, the surveyor needs to do some test work. All the raw data from every station and all the individual scans need to be analyzed and cautiously combined with each other. But no worries, this is not a manual job. Software takes care of it all. Once the entire project is put together, we can safely claim that a replica of existing conditions is born. All that remains to do is to provide the point cloud file in a special format that is useful to the architect. The field scanning is done and our collaborator hands over the file. So what is next? During the next few minutes, let me give you a taste of what goes into transforming a point cloud into a useful 3D model. For this demonstration, let's take a look at our existing building. This one is located in Philadelphia, the Museum of Art, where about a year ago we needed to have a large event inside and needed to create a 3D model of the main atrium. The place is really interesting, rather large, and offers interesting challenges. Not so much the main staircase, but the height of the ceiling and the detail on the columns and high outcrops. And yes, in case you were wondering, the statue of Rocky is located just right outside of the famous stairs. Not that our young crowd will recognize it as I came to realize not too long ago. For this job, we got help from surveillance experts, Trimble MEP. After explaining the goal for the project, they got right down to it and got ready for a half a day of work at the site where a team scanned the whole atrium from multiple strategic stations a maximum of about 20 if I can remember correctly. The main space with a triple hide requires several passes and the hallways from the lower floor and the upper level took no more than three per wing. Luckily, this edifice is rather symmetrical and offered long views, but occasionally they had the casual visitor walking to the floor and they also got included in the final scans. The second part of the process included once again and making use of the tripods, now with a high-res camera taking photos of every corner. As we understood, the color of these images will later be assigned to each one of the points of the cloud as RGB values. Finally, a smaller scanner and handheld device also took part in the capturing of every visible surface. We agreed in advance on a specific point cloud file format that our architectural software could read. This is an important subject when planning or hiring these new services. You must be sure the file format is compatible with your design system back at the studio. Let's talk about some of those popular point cloud file formats. I'm sure this will come as new information to many of our architect listeners. LAS, industry standard public format used by many laser scanners. LAZ is a compressed version of LAS. PTS, 
This is the most common cloud format, but keep in mind it also creates large memory files. E57. This format allows greater amount of information per point. XYZ. This one is a basic format, but it may not store color information. RCS and RCP are point cloud proprietary file formats. Now that we are more familiar with the attributes of different file formats, let's see how the import process works. For this project, I'm running Vectorworks Architect. Under the File menu, you will find a list of import options. We'll run the import point cloud command. The designer will be presented with this window, where we'll need to locate the point cloud file. Here, as I display the file types, we can observe the list I mentioned a few slides before. Our museum was delivered as an LAS file type. The file seems to be over 600 megs, so I am sure I'll find it very rich in detail. It was explained to me that in order to maintain a good level of performance, Vectorworks Architect limits the import to a maximum of 35 million dots. And here we have it, our imported point cloud. It is interesting, it can almost pass for a solid object, but I have to keep remembering, I'll be dealing with just a cluster of points with color values. In our next chapter, I'll show you what it feels like to navigate through a point cloud. As a designer, a logical next step is to navigate through this cluster and analyze it, study it, so we can start thinking about a plan of attack. In other words, come up with a plan on how to start modeling our whole atrium. Flyovers and walkthroughs are some of the tools I'll be using, but I find the best way to isolate areas or portions of this point cloud is by using what we call the clip queue. Here I'm finding myself reviewing floor by floor, and if I hold one of the clip cube sides, I can start seeing the cross sections of this project. I decided I would tour the place like my team did in real life, so we'll start at the bottom of the staircase. I can tell the 3D model will require a series of columns. They all look about the same. Their bases are massive rectangular walls, but we can also see the detail of the different ledges at various heights. We see the guardrails, benches, a few large openings to the exhibition halls, and I can almost see some of the paintings on the walls, but I don't think we have to worry about those. I could, but it's not necessary. Once we know the scope of work, let's start by creating views from what we already have. And yes, you guessed correctly, even though we have not created a single solid object, we can extract views directly from our point cloud. Let me show you the process. Once again, we make use of our clip cube. I'll drag and set the top face just a few feet above the second floor slab. From that position, I'll be able to create a section viewport. Remember, viewports are just a representation or a snapshots of a source. The mechanics are simple. I'll provide a name, select a scale, the type of rendering, and in this case, I'm selecting OpenGL. I let it process, and my target destination is now a brand new sheet with a title block and everything. All I need to do is to move this viewport to the top left corner and repeat the process again for the other views I need. After chatting with some co-workers, we determined we needed to start a sheet containing two floor plans, two cross sections, and a larger scale wall section, or in this case, a column section. Once the layout was completed, I was able to plot this sheet for review and fine tune my beam modeling sequence. I made my list and it's now time to start modeling.
I decided to dedicate the time to get used to create shapes from basically tracing over a ghost. Keep in mind, this project is all about recreating existing conditions and in reality only the surfaces are necessary. The new design will take place in between interior surfaces. Even though Vectorworks Architect provides a smart stair tool, I decided to approach this staircase by a direct modeling method. Like I said, we're only looking for surfaces. So the first step is to isolate this portion by using the clip cube. Right away, I realized I had to get comfortable at setting working planes and save them just in case I wanted to go back to them. Let's create some steps. I can see the points that make the surface of the risers and as you can imagine, it is now a matter of snapping to the points, connecting the dots in some fashion. Yes, there are a lot of steps, so I won't make you look at the entire process. Now, fast forward and we have our first planar polyline and it is time to push and pull. I'll just drag the face and type the distance, done. That was not complicated at all. The other risers were created in the same way. Next is the step wall. Same process. We'll isolate these points and we'll set a new working plane right on the outer face of the wall. Now it's just a matter of looking at it straight on and it's time to trace a new polyline. Once we're done, we'll extrude the surface about 30 inches and the point cloud was detailed enough that I could actually see the reveals and, well, I used them and completed my first task of the morning. Lesson learned, isolate, set working planes, trace and model. Next on my list was to uh, take care of the columns. The steps are the same as mentioned before. First we isolate and then we create a working plane. Tracing a column is a walk in the park, not a big deal. In fact, we only needed to trace half of the profile. You guessed right. This column will be modeled as a swept object. The capital, the top part, is purely direct modeling. I had a chance to prepare a sequence so we all learn about what it takes to model a piece like this. First we start with a 2D polyline, then we'll give it volume. Then we apply an inverse bulge that makes the solid curvy in the middle. Then we make both end faces a little thicker and we are done. Once we turn on the point cloud, we can see the match is almost perfect, close enough for our intended use. This project holds several columns and we just made one. So what follows? Well, first we'll isolate the entire right wing mezzanine. We'll need to create seven more columns. If we go back to our original column, I'll show you how to convert it into a symbol. Symbols are a great resource, especially when designing repetitive units we know will go through several modifications. This is much faster and efficient than making copies. This will help me make changes and see all column instances update. Once I play the symbols in the right location, let me demo for you how a change to the shaft of the column will be reflected everywhere. So, once our columns are taken care of, we make the point cloud visible and we can see that we are truly making progress. Let's move on to the highest point of this project. Here we find a row of clear story windows. In real life, these are about 60 feet above level. Believe me, not easy to reach with a tape measure. By using the wall tool, we'll trace over the point cloud. Walls are smart objects used by architects over and over again, mainly for the many benefits these offer, like proper representation of thickness and all of its components. Another benefit 
is this can be stored by style and directly report data to spreadsheets. However, in this case, and for our current need, I'll use the wall tool because it is a three-dimensional object that will let me insert windows into it. Once the walls are in place, it is time to drag from the resource library a window I have prepared with the exact dimensions. It is just a matter of inserting it into a wall. Then we'll drive 14 copies towards the end of the wall and done. Now let's concentrate on some smaller details like the crown moldings. We'll follow the same steps. First, isolate. Then trace over it in front of you until we complete the profile. The next solid operation is called Extrude Along Path. Once we are done with it, it's time to drag a copy just below the window seals. Now we'll compare this with a point cloud, and it seems like, again, we made good progress. Next on our list, modeling a slab over a point cloud. First, we use our clip cube. From a top view, we'll trace the interior corners of the slab, and let's not forget we have a void in the middle and over the staircase. With just a few clicks, we just created the base 2D polyline for the slab. Right click over the object and we'll transform it to a slab. Once the slab is done, we need to adjust some parameters like the needed thickness and the color attributes. Finally, we have our slab and we'll soon integrate it with the rest of the model. The whole modeling process took me a few hours, with just a few coffee breaks in between. Luckily, this project is quite symmetrical, so finishing one side allowed me to use the mirror tool, which helped me a lot. I still needed to add the cover ceiling and other small shapes like the statue and its base, but nothing great. So now let me show you what the final as is 3D model looks like. Keep in mind, this is not an animation. I'm actually navigating around the model by using what is called a gamer mode, sort of like walking in a video game. The modeling part was a fun task, no doubt about it. But we have to remember the main objective, produce drawings for those who have a special design in mind. Having a model is certainly a big plus since we can print views from any angle of the project. If our designers want to sketch ideas, we can provide the baselines for them, not a problem. If you remember from early slides, I show you how to start a sheet with just a few project views from the point cloud. By replacing the cloud source with the beam model, we start obtaining cleaner floor plans, sections and interior elevations. Working with viewport technology is by now a common practice among many practitioners. These provide great flexibility and respond well to graphic changes, like providing hatches to our coplands, switch from color to black and white, and most important, these hosts are annotations and drawing titles fully coordinated between other project sheets. Existing condition drawings we are all used to dealing with them. But in this case, I am particularly proud of being able to create full project sections, very precise and all from a scan job. Once again, not an easy task without the help from our Trimble friends. Another plus or benefit of having a model is the vast amount of graphics that we can produce. This one, for example, combines five viewports in different views, all nicely laid out. Perhaps a graphic that we can use to bounce ideas later on with our designers, or perhaps something that we can add to our final set of construction drawings as a cover sheet. We'll decide later. In summary, 
During this presentation, we learn about point cloud technology, the benefits this technology brings to the AEC industry, and how a new generation of surveyors work the point cloud pipeline on a daily basis. We also mention the different point cloud formats our collaborators can offer. We talk about the process a designer can go through after importing a point cloud. And finally, we watch a demonstration on different 3D direct modeling and parametric tools for recreating existing conditions for a real project. Okay, I think it's now time to move on to questions. I have quite a few in our GoToMeeting panel. And uh, right next to me, I have a friend, Fahad. Uh, he is one of the developers for Point Cloud. And Fahad, I have the first question for you. Uh, we have from our audience one that is interesting. Uh, it says, uh, would you please uh, elaborate a little more about the uh, point cloud formats, the different point cloud formats that are in the market. So what can you tell us, Fahad? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So when people see that there's so many formats that are supported in Vectorworks, they, they try to understand why each one of them is important. So if you are asking yourself this question, I would just recommend you stick to the LAZ format. So the good thing about this format is it is a compressed version and stored uh, in the binary format on your hard disk. This will, this will save you a lot of space once your point cloud starts getting bigger. The other formats are used for specific reasons by industry specialists, and they know what they are. So, for instance, uh, E57 is used to store every individual scan and its transformation relative to the other ones. So, people who work, who need it for specific reasons, know that they are definitely going to use that format. So, if you are just a regular user, I'd recommend you use LAZ format. It'll save you disk space and it'll load faster. So LAZ is a, uh, the format you would recommend for? Yes, LAZ, yep. Perfect. Uh, let's move on to another question. Uh, we have another one, and this one is in relation to computer systems. Uh, what type of computer system is necessary in order to design with point clouds? So um, that's an interesting question. So point cloud is since a new feature, you might think that you need a more spec'd up computer to run it, but that's not the case. So all the vector work specifications for 2016 are good, like your computer should run point cloud just fine. But for some customers who are running older computers, the more RAM, the better it is to run point cloud. And so from what I can understand, they might be running with two gigabits of RAM, and I would recommend they upgrade to about four, which is, which is really good. And in terms of graphics card, generally being uh, up to three generations behind a graphics card is considered okay. Once the fourth generation launches, you should generally try to upgrade since now you are four years behind the current state of the art. So anything up to the last two or three generations, I would say is okay and it should run vector, uh, point clouds and vector works just fine. Excellent, let's move on to, uh, we have another question. Uh, it reads it reads here, I think I can use point cloud scans for my next project, but uh, what format would you recommend if I request to the survey team? So what format would you recommend I request to the survey team? So, mm -hmm. so that's an interesting question, and we had to do that when we worked with Trimble on the, on the museum project. So they asked us what format do we want, and we told them we want the LAZ format because it's, it's a small file. As, as small as it can be essentially because other formats such as PTS and uh, XYZ they store numbers in text files as ASCII which takes up a lot more space per point so essentially your files become really hard to handle because they will go over 100 gigs 200 gigs and you can't really email those files around um, so if he's asking this question I would recommend LAZ format it has the advantage of being a compressed format and it's lossless compression. So you will not lose any points. It'll just be, it'll just take up less uh, or smaller disk space. All right, so uh, I have another question over here and I think I know the person, um, the architect is actually asking this one uh, from uh, Phoenix. Um, 
Is there an automatic way to transform a point cloud to a 3D object without having to take the time to trace over? So what do you think, Fahad? Do you think there's an easy way to just press a button and automatically, boom, we have the model? Um, everybody would wish that was true, but no, currently there is no way you can do that right now. Um, so the goal of our team is to give all these architects the ability to use point clouds and you know make it more usable for themselves and their customers and we provide the tools where you can do that so uh so one of the goal so one of the cool things is like snapping it allows you to quickly snap to points and then in the clip cube you can quickly isolate a bunch of components that you're interested in so these are the tools that we currently have if you're talking about a fully triangulated mesh that stuff can visually look good but it's very unusable so the current uh, meshifying algorithms, if you'd like me to call them, what they do is they reduce the actual number of points and they run on this subset of the original point cloud and create a triangulated mesh as best as they can, which means there are a lot of holes in there, some of the triangles are malformed, and there are a lot of issues with the final mesh. So that's the current state of the art. And with that mesh, you can only just use it for visualizations because you're missing a lot of points in the corners that you might actually need to snap to if you're trying to lay out a wall correctly or set up a slab correctly. So I'd recommend you stay in point cloud and then do it instead of taking this route where some some softwares do try to give you this meshification, but it's, it's not useful. It only gives you a visual cue of what uh, the walls look like, but from a BIM point of view, it's not really useful because you will miss a bunch of the corner points where you would want to snap to in the mesh. And then the mesh has a lot of holes and um, a lot of unevenness because the points are randomly sampled uh, when they're being subset for the meshification process. So the mesh is just a rough idea of what it looks like, but it's not really useful. So currently we are working on more tools that will help you use, uh, make the point cloud more usable for you guys but there is no silver bullet or there is no one magic button that will solve all these problems. Excellent, Fahar. Now, uh, here's another question, and uh, I think this is one that I had uh, early in this project. How does one go about making a point cloud less dense on screen? So, point density uh, can affect a bunch of things. For instance, point density can affect the user's ability to view point clouds uh, or uh, to interact with them. It can make the experience good or bad. So the only thing that we do for users and that happens automatically is when you load in a point cloud, we check to see if the number of points in that data set are over 35 million. If they're over 35 million, we will automatically cap the, the number of points to 35 million and bring in only 35 million points because eventually, once you bring the point cloud into Vectorworks, you want to be, you want it to be usable. So if you're navigating through the point cloud is very slow, or your snapping doesn't work right, then there's no point of using it. Which is why we've automatically done this performance cloud, uh, uh, point cloud density estimation and taken care of it for the users so that, so that they don't have to. But in the newer versions, we might give more ability to the users to even thin out their point clouds or make them more dense if they want to because some people are requesting features like these. So uh, maybe in the future releases. Excellent. I think we have a couple of, uh, a couple of more questions. Let's see, this one reads, um, it wasn't shown during the presentation, but is there a way to ungroup the point cloud and remove the points? I guess he's uh, mentioning about uh, right. breaking the point cloud or isolating or... I was wondering about that one. What, what do you have to say? Yeah, so when you look at a point cloud, your first intuitive uh, response is, oh, it's a bunch of 3D stake objects because it's a bunch of points. But that's uh, not entirely true. So point cloud is one object that contains a bunch of points. It's not a bunch of independent points uh, that, that you might think. And from a user perspective, it might not even matter but from an implementation point of view it is very important if we allow users to bring every single point individually that will that will 
degrade the user experience when they're interacting with the point cloud. By keeping all those points as one object, we can do really good optimizations and make the user experience very fluid for the customer. So essentially it's one object. Now since it's one object, you cannot do the removal, addition, and all these sorts of things because just think of it as one object that contains many points. But what you can do is you can use the clip cube and that is the current best way to deal with point clouds by sectioning out stuff. But there might be newer features related to this and they're in the works, so hang on. All right, uh, I think this is, uh, this is plenty. Uh, thanks, you, thanks for coming. Uh, it was yeah, really, really, really great to have you here. And um, yeah, thanks for having me. All right, now I'm gonna switch to, uh, uh, to just let me, let me get the microphone over here on my side. One, one moment. Well, today has been very fun, and if you need to know more information, contact us at hello at vectorworld.net and an invitation for upcoming webinars, organic prototyping with a subdivision tool. That one is really cool. July 23rd, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, presented by Jacob Dale. Another one coming is Introduction to Energy Modeling Using Enegos, July 28th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, presented by our friend Francois Levy. And don't forget to visit our inspiration page for more continuing education opportunities, www.vectorworlds.net slash inspiration. See you soon.